on the air once again with another edition of uh, Patients on the News. Uh, still doing Zoom. Works pretty well. Hope it works well for everybody at home. Again, I'm Harold Patients. I've been hosting this show for, I think, 14 years. We've had maybe 125 or so uh, different guests and shows. And uh, it's always very interesting and something very much different tonight. Uh, we don't have a politician. We don't have a newsmaker. We have a news reporter. And I'm happy to welcome to the show Marion McHugh, who is the owner of the Portland Phoenix. There was another Portland Phoenix years ago, but now we have a Phoenix, uh, a reborn Phoenix uh, that came into existence last year. Marion is a veteran of the news business, and among other things, was a longtime uh, editor and owner uh, of the uh, Forecaster, which a lot of people are familiar with, and they're going to be very familiar with uh, the Phoenix that we're going to discuss. Welcome, Marion. Thank you so much, Harold. So, Marion, you've been in the uh, newspaper. We're going to get to the, the Phoenix, but You've been in the newspaper business a long time, and tell, tell me how you got into it. Were you a journalism major, major? Well, you know, Harold, I always just loved the newspaper business. I, you know, when I was in high school, when I was in college, out in the Midwest, the first thing I did almost was go down to the office of the Daily Cardinal, which is the University of Wisconsin, because I wanted to join the newspaper. I just love to find out what's going on in the world. I'm kind of endlessly curious. So I got into the business and, um, and I've, I've just always been interested in it. And then eventually came back to Maine through after various experiences in, in uh, New York on, on magazines and whatnot and got involved with the forecaster. So I'm, and I'm very interested in local news. And I think local news is where the Phoenix is really, going to take off right now so well we're going to talk yeah. a little, we're going to talk a lot about that so you uh, uh, so everybody knows you're a native of this area you grew up here mm -hmm. and then you went off to the university of wisconsin and you didn't come back for a while huh right and you uh, had a career in uh, journalism and then you decided you'd like to come home exactly exactly right well that's great and we're glad you're home. Now let's talk, uh, we're gonna talk about journalism generally and uh, about the Phoenix, but why don't you just tell us a little bit about the Phoenix. Some people remember when we had, as many several New England cities had, including Boston, a Phoenix newspaper, which was a so-called alternative uh, newspaper, a weekly free newspaper, and um, and then it went out of business and you, among other things, uh, owned and ran the Forecaster uh, for a long time. It was very successful. Then you sold it to the Lewiston Sun Journal. And, um, and now you're back in business and with a new newspaper, which is the, the new Phoenix. And uh, tell us why, what you thought was missing, what you thought you could do with the new Phoenix? Well, I guess you could conclude from that, I just can't stay out of the newspaper business, which I think would be fair enough. I think, you know, the old Phoenix is the Phoenix in Boston. It was, a, it was the time of, you know, the rebellion and the Vietnam War, and those papers were very much a part of that, that time. Um, and then, as you said, the Phoenix had various, various uh, iterations. And then the, the Phoenix that was most recently in Portland was part of that group. Although I don't think it, Steve Mindick, the original founder, I don't, I'm not sure he was very, very closely involved with that. It was owned by someone else. And then it went out of business in February 2019. And uh, they just weren't, I think, hitting their mark in terms of the news they were providing. And I felt with my longtime business partner, Karen Wood, 
that this was perhaps an opportunity to bring the paper back, but in a very different form that was more geared towards towards real local news and not not filtering local news or news stories through a prism of ideology, but following what were the interesting stories and stories that aren't going to be told by the monopoly media, main today media. Um, and we thought we could do that, but we wanted to keep the things, the strong things for which the Phoenix was famous, the arts coverage. Uh, we have a lot of the best Phoenix writers from Sam Feifel and uh, Megan Grumbling and others, uh, and Ed Beam, also one of the one of the premier arts writers in Maine, still doing strong arts coverage, which was a strong carryover. But we also wanted to have you know a strong comment and opinion section, but segregated more onto opinion pages and not not necessarily influencing the news, you know, the news coverage that we were trying to provide, which would focus on things in Portland and in this general area locally that that other papers weren't covering. So for, for example, well that's uh, we have a daily newspaper have for a long time. Um, it seems to me, and much of this reflects the changes uh, in the field of journalism over the past several years uh, with the digital editions and so forth. But uh, they've all had some financial difficulty that the regional dailies have. And a lot of it, it seems to me, a lot of people still read the daily newspapers in communities our size basically for three things. Sports, they get the local sports, and particularly not during the COVID period, but particularly when we're not shut down, high school sports are very big with these regional dailies. Obituaries. Obituaries are very big attraction to the regional dailies. And crime. A lot of crime, obits, and sports. So you're not trying to duplicate that, is that right? No, not at this point. You know, we're very limited as a startup, you know, in terms of our personnel. I've got two reporters and, and a lot of freelance help. Um, so we're not doing that, but I, you're certainly right on the mark. I mean, I can't see us doing sports, but some of the stronger new weeklies that have started uh, like seven days over in Vermont, which is in Burlington, which is kind of a model for us, very successful. They're, they're doing obituaries, so eventually. But right now we're trying to use our resources to cover, to really cover the local news and provide um, provide coverage that the that the Press Herald that those papers are not going to provide because they're essentially all one paper now. You know the forecaster isn't separate. Forecaster stories and Sun Journal stories will all appear in the Press Herald. So it's there's not a distinction. It's all one. It's all one thing, and we're trying to be independent and do our own independent uh, newspaper. Well, you said you said a, di a different form, uh, local news. You you're trying to give people uh, the local news, and you said not through the prism of ideology. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, I think sometimes in some papers, and and maybe somewhat. Uh, the previous Phoenix, you know, a news story would be printed and it, it would sort of assume that you would, it would try to tell you how to think about the story or assume that you all, ha that you had the same point of view about the story. Um, I mean, I think we want to do analysis, we want to do interpretation, mm -hmm. but I'm just sort of, as I said, I've sort of this old fashioned, I've been in the news business a long time and I'm, I'm used to just putting news out there because I think what people really want is information and um, they want to know what's going on but you're absolutely right they they pick up 
papers for those reasons that you mentioned, uh, obituaries and sports, among other things. Uh, it's, it's true, but we want to give people, we, we have the freedom maybe to focus. The, the, the Press Herald has to cast a very wide net, and even though they have a tremendous amount of resources, they're covering you know, a lot of bases, and we try to stay local and cover some stories that they're not getting to. We were the only paper, the first paper, to be really covering the Police Citizen Review Subcommittee, which is now the focus of a lot of discussion and issues on whether, to what extent, there's going to be civilian oversight of the police department and, and to, you know, check, check in on those things that maybe aren't getting covered in the daily. So, it, so how do you, you're the editor, so I know what editors do. I used to work for the Portland Press Herald at one time, for a very short time, uh, when I was uh, in between the U.S. Navy and law school. But uh, I know the editors thinking about ideas, saying to reporters, so look, we got find out about this. this uh, I'm curious about this or whatever. So you do that. and. So you read the local newspaper, uh, trying to figure out what they're covering, and then you, what, you just have ideas about things that you folks should cover? Um, yes, and I'm very fortunate that I also have a very skilled managing editor, Mo Melsack, who's working with us, who also has a, a lot of experience uh, at the forecast and also many other papers. And he's very, he, he comes up with a lot of ideas uh, also. So, and we get ideas from our whole staff. I mean, the salespeople may be out on the trail and they say, look, look what's happening down here. There's a lot going on at Thompson's Point. What should we do with that? And, you know, ideas can come from everywhere. I, I try to think of a few, but you're right. I am reading the, the Portland paper very <laughs> very uh, faithfully and Bangor too, because Bangor of course is, you know, is also in this market in its own way. So it's kind of an interesting. Uh, uh, it, it, it is in the market, isn't it? And actually yeah. you think about it, the Boston Globe is, but not with local news. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to find out much about Maine or obituaries or whatever right. uh, by, by reading the Globe, but uh, you're right about, uh, uh, the Bangor dailies. So as you look ahead and you now have this new enterprise uh, and you, you think about uh, looking down the road, the newspaper business and how it has been changing, do you think about how it might change some more and how that affects what you're doing? Well, if, if I, if I could really give a good answer to that, I think I might go into the consulting business or something. Yeah. It's, it's very hard to see, but I guess I've had the belief that even as things, as information and news migrates to online, which that there's still a role for the, for the newspaper as, you know, for reading in the newspaper. We, we have a very good online, you know, a website, but, and I know we, we were talking about this the other day, but um, I think... I think for a lot of people and for presenting, uh, for presenting advertising, I think the news that, you know, a, a newspaper that you can pick up free, um, you know, it is a, is a good way to fulfill the needs of the advertiser. And I think it's sort of, I guess my, it's sort of back to the future or something that I think that, you know, we may go back to some of those things. I mean, things have definitely changed and shifted, but I'm not sure. I mean, I think online, for me, when I read, when I read a story, uh, it's easier for me, maybe um, just the, the way my reading works to, to really grasp the story and read it more fully if I'm reading in a paper format. Most, for many people and younger people, that's not true, which is why it's really important that we've also promoted our online site because we, we have to do both those things. So, so it's, uh, you have to mix both those things, but I'm really not 
smart enough to know where it's all going, but we know that people will always need news. You know, you know that, you know, if your neighbor, in your example, if, if Mr. Jones did pass away and if we were still in the age of having funerals, you might, you'd want to know where to go and how to pay your respects. Yeah. You should want to know where the council meeting is and what they're considering. And most of that is local. You know, I think most of that um, is really local. So, you, so there is, you, you, you cover, in a, in a sense, you cover local politics. You cover what's happening at town hall, at city hall. You cover what's happening with the councils. Uh, do you, what, and what about state issues? It's some things that might be happening in Augusta. Well, we do also try and pay attention for that. And this is where we, I'm happy to link ourselves also. And if, if we have a model at all, it, it, you know, the, it was the main times. Um, although we're not a statewide paper and financially, I think that, that wouldn't work as well. We do have Doug Rooks, who is a former editor of the main times, who is, who is happily doing a lot of freelance stories for us, trying to pay attention to the state house and especially how that will affect people, people uh, in our area. So, and we've got some pretty good, he's, he's working on a big freelance story now that will be out next week, not this week, um, that, that we're looking forward to because we don't want to ignore that, definitely. Um, and, and again, as always, you're trying to find a niche if you, if, one thing you know, you you like to write a story that the, the the daily newspaper has missed or hasn't had the resources to cover, uh, and uh, sometimes you can find, I suppose, a story in the local newspaper that's kind of superficial, and you can decide if we're going to dig into this a little. Do you ever do that? See something that they cover and say, let let's get an Let's get into this a little and see what we can reveal. Yeah. So, all right. So you you have a you 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 you're, you're creating and have created and you've done it before a newspaper full of news that people in this region would be interested in knowing about. Basically. I hope so. <laughs> so. Uh, how how do you distribute? I mean, you you can you can produce a paper, but the key is getting it into the hands of readers. So tell me about that. That intrigues me a little. Tell me about how this newspaper gets distributed. I see you 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 might put it at a newsstand. I work at one city center, so it might turn up in the news center there, but uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, little newsstand. How do you get it out to a lot of people? Well, we work with a, this is where there's, there is a bit of a symbiosis or something with the folks at Maine Today Media. Um, they, 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 they run the operation essentially that distributes a lot of the free weeklies because they have the forecaster now um, and also other, other weeklies. So we actually pay them to distribute uh, our paper and the biggest, you know, we're getting rid of, you know, in the Forest Avenue Hannaford's, which is one of our big distribution points. We can't even keep them on the stands. We're getting rid of a lot of them. But it has been a challenge, of course, with this pandemic because a lot of some places don't really want us anymore in the in their stores. And of course, people for a long time, it's changed a bit now weren't going to the stores as much and might not see us. But, but I think that's, um, that's, that's changed a bit. I, I, you know, we, so we do rely on the, we work with them and we're appreciative that, you know, the main today media that we're, we're using their distribution. So. So for the first time in your long journalism career, you're learning how to put out a newspaper during a pandemic. Very good information to have. Right. You're learning a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, 
you know, you worry, you worry most about your, your people because we weren't in the office at the beginning and now we're in the office somewhat. And it's, it's a worry that any of your folks are, are going to come, come down with it or, and, and that we're doing, you know, and that's a, wor a worry. Um, the covering Zoom meetings, you know, as I don't know how many meetings you're watching of your local council or anything these days, but uh, the Zoom formats and dealing with the Zoom formats are, are challenging for, for our reporters like uh, Colin and Elizabeth. We, I hope, I think they're going to have a great temptation in these small towns and in Portland to stay with the Zoom formats because I think it might be much easier for them. I kind of hope they don't, um, but we'll see. Uh, obviously they have to now, but um, it, it is challenging. And, um, it, you know, the world, we started, we, we undertook this in April of, of 2019 and we actually had our actual launch in November of 2019. And when you think back, the world was so much different. Um, we couldn't have contemplated this, but we don't have a choice. You know, we, we just want to continue. We don't have a choice but to continue, really. And we're, um, I, I agree, and uh, we talked a little before. I, I think things are going to come back. It may take till summer and fall. But I think I think things are are going to come back pretty well in this calendar year. That that so it gives me. I'm a, I happen to be an optimist by nature, but it gives me perhaps reason for optimism. So in the past, Marion, a lot of these, a lot of these, almost every alternative, so-called alternative newspaper from back in the '70s and '80s and '90s did have an ide ideological prism. You mentioned the phrase ideological prism. Almost everyone did. And still, I don't know, is the Bollard still the competitor of yours? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, be it's uh, become the Mainer. It's run by Chris Busby still. But yeah, yeah. they do a lot of online stuff and he publishes every month, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I think he does a pretty good job. I've, I've, I've read yeah. some of this stuff, but but they have an ideological prism, I think. Uh, and do you, I'm not asking you to comment, I'm just telling you what I, what, what, what I think. So do you think that it's somewhat unique for, well, you're, you're a weekly, there are a lot of weeklies around, uh, not to have an ideological prism, uh, uh, not to see things through an ideological prism, not to have that kind of a bias. Uh, the forecaster seems to me never had a bias. Of that kind, political bias. Right, and it it became successful. Um, I I get I certainly want to do editorials, and you know we have commentators that are commenting from a pretty uniform left of center perspective, which I'm certainly comfortable with. I just don't want news stories to to be written in a to, to reflect what the writer thinks, uh, you know, should promote his or her ideology, I think. Um, you know, Peter Cox in his book about the Maine Times writes a lot about, you know, training the reporters who were trying to, and, and that was certainly a paper that you might characterize as having an ideological perspective. It was certainly liberal, but mainly mostly environmental. Um, training reporters who felt that their perspective and their take on the issue or the story was so important that it, it was, you know, it, it got ahead of the facts. And Peter Cox writes about trying to train the reporters not to do that and simply to be fair. I mean, I'm, I mean, any reporter has ideology, has perspective, has opinion. There's nothing, objectivity is really not a, uh, is, is a bygone standard, I think. But, but you do have to be fair and you do have to be honest and you, you have to, your, your relationship with your readers has to be telling them the truth and not what you think they 
they, you know, what you think will lead them in the direction of a certain ideology, ideology or point of view. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you major in journalism at the University of Wisconsin? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's, that's, that's fine. But you've been a journalist your adult life, uh, right? Well, even as a sub-adult, I, uh, I, I, I really, when I started out, as I mentioned, I went out down to the, to the Daily Cardinal, which was, and this was Madison, a very radical campus starting in 1970. And believe me, it was a radical paper. And it was all, it was, it was certainly a very strong anti-war focus and all that. And, you know, it was still, and that's where I really felt like I got a lot of training. And then I went, uh, after Madison, I worked on a magazine in New York, which was also a very left of center enterprise. It was a collective called Seven Days, and one of the people on the collective was Dave Dellinger. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, the so, real McCoy, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I do come from that. I'm, I, just, I just want to respect the reader and um, give them information. So... So how so the reason I asked you about your background in journalism is uh, we seem to be in a different place. I'm I'm older than you, and I've been around a long time. I've been kind of in and out on the fringes of journalism for a very long time. Uh, it is very difficult to be fair and honest, uh, and people seem to be more passionate now about politics and, uh, and political events than they have been probably since the days of the Civil War, since the mid-19th century. Um, it has happened before. It has happened at the beginning of the 19th century. It happened at the time of the Civil War. It's happened in various epochs of American history. Uh, but now we're dealing with social media and what Kellyanne Conway called alternative facts. So you talked about facts. You want to bring people facts. And there are a whole lot of people, hopefully not your readers, but a whole lot of people in this country who say there's no such thing as a fact. Now, I'm a lawyer. I deal in evidence. But there's a whole lot of people. This scares the hell out of me. There's a whole lot of people that don't think there's such a thing as a fact. And uh, so there are some people that might say, hmm, Marion is a real optimist. She wants her reporters to deal with the facts. Facts? What are those? You want to comment on that? Uh, well, that's tricky. You know, you're absolutely right. This is a very tough, polarized environment, and I don't know people are selecting their own facts, as Moynihan warned that you couldn't do. Um, so I don't know, I think, I think we just have to hope that, there, that the news media um, who exist and become respected and continue, you know, let's, you know, something like the Washington Post, papers that you can really admire, um, hold their ground and still are able to publish because, you know, the information that they've just published, especially in the last couple of days, you know, running, uh, airing a tape of, of uh, Trump's, Trump's uh, lecture to the Secretary of State down in Georgia. I mean, those, that role of the fourth estate uh, is so important and we can't lose that. And I, you know, I, I'm a lo we're a long way from getting to that point at, at, here at the Phoenix, but if we look, but we do need to still aspire to that. We can't give up and um, to the role of social media, but I, you're absolutely right. And it's, I mean, I, I spend probably too much time looking up things, you know, checking things on Facebook and, and maybe Twitter, and you do get a lot of information. Um, but there's there's so much uh, so much stuff out there that's 
really not helpful, that it's really, it is unfortunate. And um, so, so I, I hope we move away from that, but I'm not smart enough to see how it's going to happen or what the impacts will be. I, as I said, I tend to be an optimist and I only know how to do what I'm doing here because it's all, it's, it's the only journalism experience I've had. So, um, but, but the change in the world, when you look back, even, even at TV programs or things going on in the nineties, um, and what that world was like sort of before the hit of social media, it's really quite striking how much the world has changed. So when you, when you think about stories that you think would be of interest uh, to your readers, you know, the obvious uh, is they are always, well, what's happening in city government? What are they doing? What are they trying to do? Because uh, everybody, it affects everybody, so they're interested in it. But what about people? So we read about people, I read about people in the Portland Press Herald, and I want to know more about them. And uh, so do you do any pieces about people telling us, here's what makes this person tick. This is an inter This person is saying something interesting. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, you know, you, you mentioned earlier an example. Um, we wrote about the new, the new chairman of the chair person, chair of the school committee in Portland and interviewed her to get her thoughts and aspirations because she had had a pretty high political profile when she took on that job, unlike uh, probably previous superintendent, uh, I'm sorry, chairs of the school yeah. committee. So we did write about her and that's a good example, but we need to do more about that. We need to be thinking of, of those people who are who are, um, who are, you know, interesting and doing things and finding them. I mean, it's really, in the last four or five months, you know, things, it's just been a very quiet time. People are, you know, hunkered down, they're, they're doing their job, they're staying at home, they're, it's, it's been a hard time to, it's just, I don't know, maybe the story ideas and, and um, finding people to write about, maybe it's been a little harder, but among the many things we need to do to improve, I think that's really a good example is writing about people because people are always interesting to read about, which is why obituaries are interesting, you know, reading about people and people's lives. It's, uh, you know, I... I read that piece in your newspaper about the chairman of the school committee. I found it very interesting because uh, everybody comes as advertised and that woman who I do not know, uh, she and her husband came a few years ago and I'm a former politician. So I kind of noticed them and, and they were noticeable and um, I had a bias. I happen to be a Democrat, and I'm sure they are too. They would view themselves as quote progressives. I don't view my I, I don't view myself as anything. And I'm not Tea Party. I'm not a socialist. I don't. You can't give me a name. Uh, so I, you know, I I just part of a very broad political party. But I read that piece about her. And it eliminated most of my biases. First of all, she's a very well-educated woman and clearly a very articulate woman. Third, I had noticed her husband more than her, but she said she should not be viewed through the prism of her former husband. And that helped me to understand her a little bit. So that kind of story, I think, is very valuable, it was very valuable to me. And uh, uh, I'm sure there are many things I don't agree with her on, but ha having the opportunity to read a newspaper story that tells me something about her, and uh, I, I think is very, very helpful, helpful to all of us, frankly. So uh, the, the, uh, 
the other thing that that I um, was wondering about in terms of uh, the newspaper business and your end of the newspaper business is how do you avoid doing people pigeonholing you say, look, I know some people that are very conservative. I happen to know them. I know one guy who's extremely conservative. I correspond with him from time to time. Very smart guy uh, and one of the better writers that I've run across. And he actually uh, occasionally puts his far right screeds in the, uh, in the press herald. And, uh, and he's good. And he's smart. And uh, I'm, as we're talking, I'm wondering, I wonder whether he would read your newspaper or whether he'd say, oh, no, it's just lefty propaganda. Because I think he thinks most newspapers are lefty propaganda. I don't think he thinks there are any newspapers that are not propaganda. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe things Breitbart is not propaganda. I don't know. But what, what I'm saying, give me a reason why he should read your your newspaper. Uh, well, I, I, I That's would, a good question, isn't it? It's a very good <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, again, it, we're just, and I, you know, the Phoenix as it exists now, I, I hope in a year when we're two and two, two years in, we'll have a lot more, uh, we'll be providing a lot more than we've been able to do now, but I would hope that he'd be interested in, in finding in in the local coverage we're going to be expanding our local coverage in in certain ways um that are that are still in the works and that i don't know if he's interested in the arts um i certainly hope that the opinion page even though our present writers well i don't i'm not sure if you can they probably lean sort of left of center but it maybe there's a dialogue that he could engage there um, but that is, that's a very challenging question, Harold. <laughs> yeah, no, I would, it, it, I it, it, would it, hope it, that he could. Yeah. Um, well, so, uh, so do so do I. But you have to somehow demonstrate to him that you you can do a story that is not one that uh, just appeals to one group of of uh, people. You know that. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I'd be interested in what you think, because you, you run the newspaper. We read a lot about, I, I read in your newspaper, uh, a piece which talked about the cruise ships. I think I wrote it down, actually. The, the, the cruise ships development, uh, you know, developers coming into Portland, uh, the build here it is the building boom. This is what your reporters wrote this piece, and and the building boom, the problem of homelessness, and the impact of the cruise industry. Now, I knew that was in the first paragraph. I knew what this story was going to be about when I read it, and uh, this guy says this. These are the problems, and he, I I agree. You know. Uh, I think the problem of homelessness, though, is not a problem that is just uh, a, a local problem. Homelessness, you can leave that on. Sorry, it's, I'm sorry it's flickering, but... That's all right, that's all right. <laughs> but but the, 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 the problem of homelessness affects every city the size of Portland or larger in America. And there are no new ideas on homelessness. There are a lot of failed ideas. But... It, it is, it is a fact. I just looked. I have a first cousin, my mother's sister's son, who's homeless. I know all about it, and it's a very, very tough problem. But uh, it's not just a local problem. Uh, but it's important to be concerned about it. Impact of the cruise ships and the building boom. So th this reminds me that there are people, many of whom probably read your newspaper, who think that this is terrible what's happening in Portland, the building boom. Because they weren't here in all the years you and I were here, where there was no building boom. When I came back to Portland in the 
late 1960s, nothing had happened in Portland since the Civil War. It just was a moribund place. You do a if you would you dare do a story? I'm not suggesting you do it, but this is a, a way of continuing this dialogue with you about the need. Somebody making a speech about the need for capital in every community, money to invest, capital. That's where it all comes from. That's what I don't want to sound like one of those right wing Republicans because. I, I, I don't agree how they use this, but capital is important. And would we see it in an alternative newspaper? If somebody says, you know, here's somebody who want, wants to invest in Portland. You can debate about whether it's going to look nice or not look nice. I don't know either, like the way it looks or whatever. But how does it hurt other than, you know, it's bad planning? That's the question, whether you can write something in your newspaper about that. Not suggesting you do, but whether you can, whether there's room. I would hope that if, uh, you know, the, if that were, you know, to the, I'm not an expert on this, Harold, so I can't really talk about uh, the issues of capital and, and coming in, but I, I would hope that we'd be open to, you know, a newspaper in this, it should surprise you sometimes with something different or some new idea that maybe you're not expecting from a traditional liberal paper. So if it was a, you know, a more conservative idea that looked at another aspect of the problem and the role of, of capital and the need for the housing, um, you're right. Homelessness is, is a, it's the, and, and housing are just the huge, huge issues right now and and uh, absolutely have to be tackled and um but i would hope we could always if the facts led us in that direction we'd we'd be open to to looking at ways of to to review the story that would be you know um unusual and perhaps surprising so yeah i think uh, it just uh, uh for instance um uh, people don't some people don't appreciate the fact that every affordable housing project every low income project requires private capital mostly from away often maybe not mostly but often people who don't even live here investing in affordable housing or uh, low-income housing and we don't see any of that in the press ever and reporters don't think that way so uh, i i i think there is a possibility we're getting a little off here but I, I, another piece that i thought was very interesting in your newspaper that is a reason for people to read your newspaper you had a, an interesting piece about Greater Portland governments planning for rising sea levels. Perhaps the greatest long term problem our community faces since we're on the sea, on the ocean. Right. The greatest. And it's not very topical. I mean, people don't write about it very much, but you did. And I was interested in that. I said, gee, that's something I want to read. And uh, you want to comment on that? Well, absolutely, and I was I I really um, suggested that to to our reporter because I'm just amazed driving around here, driving in on on uh, Baxter Boulevard every day. I keep watching for the moment at which the, you know the water is going to rise, yeah, rising over my trip, which is not far away. I mean, it's so clear and imminent, and it's very hard. We made a good try there, but we're really going to have to continue this um, because this is a this is a big issue that's we need to grapple with. And this, the cities are the city of Portland and South Portland are, you know, working on this. But it's it's just key, obviously, to to what's going to to our future here and it's it's so hard to grasp, I think, for all of us living our day to day lives and the 
in the present. I mean, we've all, we're all talking about global warming, of course, and environmental issues, but our specific vulnerability here in Portland is, is very, and in this whole area, is, is obviously very pronounced. And so I think we're, I, I'm glad you liked that story, but we need to do more of that. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very interesting stuff. And uh, I was intrigued when you said that your model, you'd love to be more like the main times than one of these alternative, more radical newspapers. Uh, you'd like to be more like the main times, which emphasized environmental things. And so uh, that article that I read in your paper was the kind of article that would appear in the main times. Well, I, yeah, I would, I mean, the main times at the beginning did an awful lot of great stuff and um, uh, knowing John Cole as I did, I mean, his writing and the thing about John Cole, I mean, he certainly was a liberal, but he could also surprise you, you know, with a different point of view and something you know, he, he was just thoughtful in his columns. But yes, we would love to um, be writing about, you know, the issues, especially environment, environmental issues, which really were the, the hallmark of Maine Times. But we need to combine that with our, you know, our focus on, on local issues, you know, our, uh, here in greater Portland. Uh, also. One of the reasons that John Cole was such a good writer an editor, and the Maine Times was looked at as mainstream. And I know that today a lot of people think, no, oh, mainstream is terrible. People in the far left, people in the far right, mainstream is bad. But mainstream means that you appeal to a wide swath of people, a very broad spectrum of people, and your newspaper, your product uh, has appeal for that wide spectrum. John Cole was able to do that. One of, I knew John Cole well. One of the reasons that John Cole and Maine Times could do that is John Cole maintained relationships with people. You said he was a, uh, a liberal guy. He was. But he had many close relationships and friendships with people who were not liberals. Right. They are the opposite. But they liked him and they trusted him and they confided in him. And they told him things. So uh, he's a very good one uh, to emulate. I have to tell you a little, little story. I'm trying to learn more about your paper, but I have to divert a little. Uh, one time I was driving with John Cole, and we were, it was late in the afternoon, 4.35 o'clock, and we were near Millbridge, Maine. In Millbridge was a state senator, Hollis Wyman, a very right-wing guy. And Hollis, Hollis Wyman was like the feudal king, the blueberry king of uh, Washington County. And uh, John said to me, uh, when we get up here to Millbridge, I'll show you where to go. We'll just go to Hollis's house. He'll give us supper. <laughs> well, Jesus, he, we didn't call him or anything. I drove, he told me how to get there. I drove up to Hollis, Senator Hollis Wyman, the very powerful Republican senator's house. And John went up, rang the doorbell. That, Hollis came to the door, he touched, come in, got me to come in. We had lobster and blueberry pie. He loved John Cole. And John Cole and he didn't share a single political opinion. But that's how Cole wrote, ran that show. And, and he had his tentacles out to everybody. So uh, that's my, my comment on that. Great story. It's a yeah. great story. Very much how he was. Yeah. And... You have a lot of contacts, too. You know a lot of people, don't you? You ran, you ran that forecaster for a long time. Yeah, well, I, I, I know a few. I mean, I've grown up around here and um, did the forecaster for quite a while. And, uh, yeah, I, I like, you know, we, we have, I have contacts that, that will help. Um, yeah, and it gives you ideas for stories. I mean, your whole experience in editors experience it gives them ideas for stories and your experience is that you grew up here this was your town you know it very well 
And so uh, I think your I think your newspaper is going to going to do quite well. And uh, and and now I'm getting hooked on it. So <laughs> and, and as you say, it will grow, right? I mean, it, you'll you'll it'll grow organically. You'll be doing different things two years from now that you're doing now. Yes. No. We have to. We've made a good start. I'm really proud of this group and my team and what we've done, but we want to get a lot better and um, keep going and, but, but put out a better product. I mean, there's no point in, we've, we've got it, you know, you just can't get up and do the same thing all the time. We want to figure out how to provide better coverage and do the kind of stories that you're commenting on because we need to do more of those. And it's, we don't always have them, you know, it's hard to get them every week, but we've got to find them and, and, um, you know, and, and uh, explore those stories. So, so you, uh, is, are you still, you and Karen Wood still associated in the journalism business? Yes, she's, she's my business partner here and co-owner. And yeah. she's the, she handles the publishing side, you know, more of the business side. Then, uh, yeah, yes. and she and, and 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 you were together at the forecaster too, right? right. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, there may be people. I'm sure there are a lot of people that know Karen, Karen as well as you. So that would be of interest to our listeners and a, and a, and a lot of people that know Karen's husband Godfrey Wood, right. who for a very long time uh, ran the Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce and also owned the hockey team, so, or was one of right. the owners of the hockey team. So uh, they're very well known, and I think that's important in the community, that uh, the, some of the writers that write for you have great appeal for, even though some of them are older, have great appeal for younger readers and activists, social mm-hmm. activists in Portland. And at the same time, uh, you and Karen have great, connections to I don't want to I don't want to spoil your reputation with some of those younger readers but you have great connections to the greater Portland establishment another bad word establishment but uh, I'm sorry to accuse you of that but it's true so there is this broad aspect to what you're doing and your experience well yeah I mean it does help to have some experience. One of the toughest things, I think, for Karen especially, um, is that normally in this time, in starting any new business, she'd be doing a lot of networking, a lot of chamber events, a lot of, because she's, because she does know a lot of people, as you say, she'd be meeting people and telling us, telling people about the Phoenix and our product, and that just hasn't happened, you know, since November, Uh, well, since March. But we, you know, we really haven't done that since for many months. Right. And that's that slowed our expansion into the community. A bit. Well, so you have a long list of post-pandemic objectives. Absolutely, we need to be better and um, but but and do, and do do certain stories. I I have some some specific ideas. Um, and, but generally, and this is why I'm so grateful to you, Harold, for, for having me on your program. We need, people need to get to know us and we need to find ways, you know, for people to find us and know who we are and pick us up at the newsstand. That's happening. Uh, people do know us, but, um, you know, as a new publication, especially in this time of COVID, it just does, it does take a while for people to figure out who you are and, um, you know, decide they're going to come back and, and pick up another copy or so back to that, the website. Yeah, no, that, that leads me to the two questions you could comment. We just have uh, a few minutes left here. Uh, but I want you to tell our listeners two things. Uh, I'll give you the both questions and you can answer them in whatever order you want. Why is it important for me, the viewer, uh, to get to know your newspaper and to begin reading it and seeing things in it that they will not see in other 
local newspapers. And where do I get it? How can I make it easy for me? Tell me where to get it and tell me why I should get it. Well, the, the second part is, of course, the easiest. Um, you know, the website is the portlandphoenix.me is the website that a lot of people are going to and our, our reports and our analytics on people going to the website are really growing very, very uh, well. And other than that, it's really the best place is uh, the stores, the big stores, um, shop, you know, Hannaford's Hannaford Shaw's those places no. are where you can routinely find it and I know that's challenging again now because people aren't going into stores so much and that's a little bit challenging well tell me about it I go once in a while and it's a lot of people in there but but all right so the story, what is the website address portlandphoenix.me portlandphoenix.me pretty simple uh, pretty simple. And now the other question, which is I want you to convince these folks watching this, uh, look them straight in the eye and say, here's why you need to read my newspaper. Well, uh, that's, that's absolutely great question. You, you need to read our newspaper because we're going to have very, um, intensive coverage of local government in this area, in greater Portland, especially Portland. We cover committees and things going on that other pa the other paper does not cover. We have arts coverage. Um, we really feel strongly that our coverage of fine arts and theater is important and that you should pick us up for that reason and that we have a forum for opinions and commentary that's really open and um, attractive to people and interesting commentators from various backgrounds. Um, but that is, you know, you constantly, you're asking the question that is perhaps, you left the hardest question for last, Harold. With <laughs> I did, uh, I did that, because you were just getting warmed up. And I figured now she's warmed up. <laughs> I'll throw this one at her. And uh, it's not, you know, some people say it's a softball. It's not really a, uh, a softball because um, you know what you want to do and you know what your objectives are and you're trying to match that with your audience. And I guess I'm hoping to provide a truly independent option for people when we're living in a in a media age where in terms of newspapers in this area, there's just one, there's just one publishing company, main today media, you know, essentially uh, based in this area. And they've taken, they're covering so much of Maine that we want to do something that's independent. And um, I guess, I guess that's, that's really the main part that we want to provide an independent alternative that's independent, but not necessarily driven by, I, I've never wanted and I never wanted on the forecaster. And it, this is perhaps why it did stay successful. I wasn't putting my own ideology first and saying, this is Marion's newspaper and we're all going to read about what Marion thinks and you know, I don't think that's of much interest. I, I, I want to, I'm really interested in what's out there and what's going on. It's, that's what's drawn me into this business. So it, it's, um, I, I want to tell people what's going on in the world around them. And especially at this time, Portland is not, a, is going to go through a great deal in the next year. Uh, it's going to, how it recovers, how this city and this greater Portland area recovers from COVID and what changes and probably permanent changes um, there are going to be in, in uh, the business atmosphere of Portland. And also there are some governmental changes like the Charter Commission. Portland is going to be looking at recasting potentially its government. And there's a lot of trends in terms of younger people coming into Portland and, you know, really asking for certain you know, looking, 
pushing certain issues like the minimum wage and a charter commission, which is really going to change, I think, the face of Portland, and we want to be there writing about it. When you do that and you write what some of these younger people, you write about what some of these younger people want and the changes they want, do me a favor because you, you'll you be explaining, you'll have an opportunity to explain something I never understood. What does defund the police mean? No one's ever explained that. No newspaper's ever explained it. Does it mean get rid of the police? No more appropriations for police and we'll just do it the, the, the way it was done in the Wild West when you do that. But look, we, we've run out of time here. And uh, this has been really interesting for me and I hope interesting for uh, our viewers, uh, many of whom will go online and uh, read your newspaper. When we end, as we end, I give you a little bit of advice. The other important thing is to get leaders, community leaders, statewide leaders talking about mentioning your newspaper and i can tell you based on 50 years of experience the only way you will get them to pay attention to your paper is to put their name in your newspaper <laughs> mention them all right well look marion it's been a pleasure and very interesting to me thank you very much for coming on Thank you, Harold. This has been this has been great fun, and I really appreciate really appreciate the opportunity to be on your program. This has been great. Thank you. Thanks a lot.